Hello again everyone. As I mentioned in my last video, I wanted to make a separate video for just the main theme music video that they released after the state of play. The video they released includes almost all entirely new scenes and actually tells us a lot of new information about the story. Without really spoiling a lot, it just creates more questions than answers. But still, I need to give a spoiler warning to people who want these scenes to be fresh. I wouldn't watch this video if you wouldn't watch the music video. Also, unlike most of my previous videos, this video is going to be a lot more tinfoil hat theory -y. As like I said, they don't give a lot of context as to what's really going on. So I'm going to have to look at the symbology and cues that I think they might have left in there in order to try to discern what exactly is going on and what it might mean. So if you want hard and fast fact, this isn't the video for you. And we probably won't know until the game launches. But if you want to sit back with some popcorn and hear some crazy theories about what might just happen in Final Fantasy 16, then this might be the video for you. So let's move on to the first scene. Here we have a close-up of Clive's face with Jill standing in the background, and then we see him stab a dagger into a crystal on the table as a man watches in the background. First, I want to establish that I'm going to call that man in the background Byron for now. The devs have mentioned a Byron who hasn't been introduced yet, and they say he's an older man and one of his favorite characters. And while he's not a super old man, he's probably Sid's age, so he's probably late 30s, so he's old enough to be called older. And I think obviously with all the scenes he's in, he's a rather important character, which is why I find it strange that he hasn't been introduced yet. So whether or not he's Byron is kind of besides the point. I don't want to call him that man for the rest of this trailer because he does show up again. And I think there's a decent chance that he actually is Byron. So we're going to go with that for now, just to make my life easier. More importantly, we see Clive has a brand on his face, but he has the red armor, not the Imperial armor. And so that places us between the Benedicta fight, where slightly after the Benedicta fight, probably when we get back to the hideaway, we know Clive loses the armor, and the volcano fight where I believe that Clive will lose his brand. So this places us in probably the first quarter of the game or so. We then see, like I said, Clive stabbing his dagger into the crystal. And there's also another dagger stabbed into this crystal as well. So to me, I think this very obviously means that Clive is agreeing to join probably Byron and Sid on their quest, whatever it is. And I think the crystal part is actually pretty important because we know that one of Clive's goals on this journey will be to destroy the mother crystals. But up to this point, we aren't quite sure how he pivots from chasing the man who killed his brother to destroying the mother crystals. And this might be the scene where everything is explained to Clive and he ultimately decides that, yeah, I'm going to help you destroy the mother crystals. So my guess is, is that Byron learned something about the mother crystals. Maybe we explore that with Sid and ultimately Clive is convinced that the mother crystals are a bad thing for humanity. The second scene is one that I think maybe we've seen before although the more I think about it the more I think it might have just been with Jill and Clive together not just Clive alone. However given the title of this song which is the main theme for the game I think this takes on a new light literally. The title of the main theme is moon gazing and that's exactly what we see Clive doing here. Now I think there are two possible reasons for why the moon is being focused on. The literal interpretation is that the moon or the little red star next to it will play a significant role in the story and maybe we even visit it like some people have theorized. The second interpretation and the one that I think is probably more likely in terms of what the developers are saying here. In this instance we see a full moon on a cloudless night as Clive gazes up at it. The moon at night tends to serve as a way to light a path. If you've ever been outside in the countryside without a moon outside like on a new moon you cannot see anything. Whereas if you have a full moon, you can actually kind of make your way around. And so symbolically, I see this as Clive searching for his path through life. And throughout the game, after he loses his brother and he's on this quest for revenge, the moon could symbolize the light in his life that keeps him on his path, which for this game will probably be Joshua for most of it, but maybe it evolves into something else as well. I mean, if you think about it, revenge historically is portrayed as a negative thing. So it could be the darkness within Clive, and then the moon is shining light to that darkness and guiding him. And really, this is just Clive's character arc and story. I think story-wise, this game will have a lot of parallels with this. We'll get a lot of side characters who have similar character arcs where they're lost in life for whatever reason, and they find something or someone that helps guide their way through this dark time. But after walking through this darkness within them, whatever it is, by following the light of the moon, they can get to the other side and live more happy and burden-free lives. And really, I think that's going to be the main theme of this game. So... As you play the game, I would probably think about this stuff. I really do think that a lot of the themes that you can take away from this game, a lot of the lessons you can learn, revolve around this. And so with that, the next scene is one that's really hard to get a read on. This is older Clive, as we can see, he's brandless and is sporting a little more beard. The scene really just has a close-up of his face as the camera slowly pans down. Maybe he's holding on to a crystal here, or maybe he's even holding on to a, another phoenix feather. We see one later on in this trailer, 
and the blue coloring I think is a little unique, but maybe there's something unique that's happening that warrants this reaction from Clive. We then see the giant flower blooming. For those of you that watched my last video, this is the flower that we see Bahama and Ifrit fighting on and that we see in the background of the Phoenix Bahama fight. And we can see what I think are houses down near the shore and maybe a castle over here. And then there's some rocks or crystals at the base of the flower. But that's not all. That really just tells us that there is some development here. It could still be in a blighted area, just it was all abandoned when the mother crystal died years and years ago. The thing that I find really interesting is if you look right here, you see a very tall spire. I'm almost positive that this is the Crystalline Dominion spire that we see on this building here. And most of the shots that we see of Drake's tail, the mother crystal at the Crystalline Dominion, have this building in front of the mother crystal. And what we're seeing here is a different perspective where we're rotating maybe 120 degrees. So we're looking at a side shot of where the mother crystal should be and the Crystalline Dominion building. And so if this is where the mother crystal should be, and we see a bunch of like crystals at the base and this flower blooming, part of me wonders if we actually destroyed the mother crystal and it disappears because we've seen the other mother crystals disappear, at least on the world map. So it's possible that the entire Drake's Tail crystal disappeared, leaving only this mound. And what we're seeing here is maybe the rebirth of another crystal. A flower blooming is often synonymous with rebirth symbolically, so it could make sense. Regardless, I already had my hunches that this was the Crystal Dominion, and this just helps to solidify it. So the next two scenes and then a scene shortly after, I'm going to skip over in this. They're all scenes that we've seen before. One is the group walking up to the blue mother crystal. One is Jill saying, you are the ones who shall bow to me. And one is just a quick snippet of the Clive Hugo fight. I've talked about all of these before in previous videos and they've all been shown before. So there's nothing new to talk about. So I'm just going to move past these. We then have a quick scene of Sid smoking a cigar in a blue crystal arena that we've seen before. You can see some blood on his lip and a lot of people are guessing that this might be his death scene. I have to say, I'm not totally convinced that it is, especially since we all saw how Sid got manhandled by Benedicta and came out fine. For smoking a cigar in your last moments, that's a trope, sure, but I don't know if I see them really playing into that trope, to be honest. Maybe he doesn't die out right here and he instead just has to take a step back, but my guess is that this is likely the scene where Clive gets Ramu's power from Sid, but it, that doesn't necessarily mean that he has to die. Honestly, I'm not sure, but I almost don't want to believe that they put such an obvious death scene in a video like this and instead they're just making another red herring here we see byron sid and clive all standing in a forest we've seen the forest biome before and clive's in his early game armor so we know that this is in the early game right before or maybe right after the benedicta fight byron seems to be waving goodbye with two fingers and really there's nothing more to note here other than this is the first close-up that we've seen of byron and that's going to be relevant later on in this video we then see mid giving a little chest thump assumingly to clive off camera you can see a bell in the background as well as some ancient ruins so based on what we've seen, I'm thinking this might be the ship that we saw with the engines in the port. And at the very least, I think this is the same dock in the ancient ruins that we saw in that same scene. It seems that Mid is sailing out with some goal in mind and she's telling us to rely on her. But that's really the best I can tell. We then get to one of the bigger scenes of the video. Here we see Typhon up close and then the camera pans out and we see his body impaled on some fractured wall by Ramu's staff. Starting with a close up, we can see a couple of circles on Typhon's forehead and the circles have a line through them. Although there are some other lines on his face that kind of look like scars so maybe it's just a scar at the top of his chest we also see some pattern thing that reminds me of the circular patterns we see in the ancient ruins and then on the zoom out if we look at typhon himself we see circles with lines through them again on his shoulders and some cloth with maybe some gold medallions hanging at his waist i'm not sure what to make of the circles with the lines through them but i think based on the arena and its features it's safe to say that typhon is at least related to the fallen ancients and we've kind of thought that for a while now now let's turn our attention to remove staff which is pinning him to some invisible but cracked wall. So first things first, this obviously tells us that Sid is with us when we fight Typhon and is still alive. If we assume that the scene where he's smoking the cigar is the very last one when he leaves the party, if not dies outright, then we can say that this fight actually happens before the Akashic Dragon, but obviously after our fight with Benedicta as we have our new outfit in this scene. The most interesting thing though is the cracked wall. Now this could be some sort of infinite mirror thing where the area is surrounded by mirrors on all sides, which makes it look like the arena stretches into infinity when it really doesn't. Alternatively, maybe this is some like extremely advanced tech of the ancients and it's a screen with some projection on it, which makes the arena look bigger than it is. Or if we want to get really weird, maybe this is some tear in the fabric of reality and this is some dimensional hole in existence. And on the other side of this, if we could open it up, is another world or space. This reminds me of scenes that Yoshi P has used in the past in 14, where at first glance, it looks like it shows a lot of information, but when you sit down and look and analyze it, it almost makes more questions and answers. And that's really something that I like about
about these videos. Then we quickly see a brandless Clive looking up into the sky as flames surround him, and in the reflection in his eyes, we see a little circular light. My guess is that he's looking up at the moon, because moon gazing, and that's the light that we're seeing. Based on the background, I have to wonder if this is right before Clive's come to me Ifrit scene that we've seen a few times as he is on fire before saying that line, and the background kind of reminds me of the same architecture. Again, this scene is just showing a more human side to Clive, in my opinion, as his face almost seems like he's sad or maybe longing for something, and if I'm right, this would be right before he transforms into Ifrit, so maybe he's recalling what it is he's fighting for. Again, finding his path, his reason for continuing on. We then see a scene that we've seen before in the Revenge trailer, just it's a little extended this time. Basically, we see Bahamut firing a mega flare at Clive, Torgal, and Jill on the ground in this barren space surrounded by crystals. It's almost impossible to tell where exactly this is, but since it is Bahamut, and the fact that earlier in this video we saw crystals all around the flower, I think that we're probably near that flower. Although that's really just a rough guess. More importantly is the new scene, which is a close-up of Jill holding a person in her arms. You can tell it's Jill because she has the bundled hair with a separate braid, and there's a rapier at her side. The interesting bit is the person in her arm. After looking around, I'm pretty sure that this person is Byron, maybe Sid, or maybe a person we haven't seen yet. Right now, my guess would be Byron, though. You can see their gloves pretty clearly in this shot. They're definitely wearing gloves on their hands, and right above the gloves, there's a little break, and then you see some either van braces that cover their forearms, or a tight jacket that goes up their forearm. If we go back to this scene, we can see that Byron wears gloves on his hands with van braces protecting his forearms. If we look here, we can see that Sid does wear gloves, and his jacket does cover his wrists. However, his jacket is a lot more loose and floppy, and I would expect to see it flopping all over and not look as skin tight as it does in this scene. So really, out of all the character models I've looked at, that only really leaves Byron left. If you can find someone that has a similar outfit, please let me know because I'm not entirely convinced on Byron. If you look at their thigh right above their knee, you can see what looks like a metal ring or maybe the top of a boot, since it's reflecting the fire differently than the cloth pants above it. And if you look at Byron's legs here in this later shot, then you can see his boots end below the knee, and there's really nothing above them besides the cloth pants. The only other option is that maybe this is an optical illusion, and what we're actually seeing is the sword he carries on his waist coming across his knee in the foreground. So we're seeing the reflection off the metal, which is in front of his leg. It's really hard to say though, and this is why I have a second guess that Jill might be holding a person we haven't been introduced to yet. And interestingly, remember that Phoenix fights Bahamut, so it's entirely possible that that person is Phoenix's dominant, or new dominant. Hell, maybe it's even Joshua if we want to get real tinfoil hatty. For now, though, that's the most we can say, and maybe keep an eye out for someone who might match this description in future trailers. The next scene, we see Benedict just hand holding a necklace with a griffin over crossed swords on a blue shield shaped emblem. We know it's Benedicta from the gloves and the yellow nail polish, although the necklace is something that we haven't seen before, and no country we know of has a coat of arms like this one on their flag. Based on the fact that we know that Benedicta has to face her past per the website's description of her, I currently only have two guesses as to what this might be about. First, this might be Sid's own emblem as the army commander from Lude, which he left behind with Benedicta after he quit when Barnabas took control. This could make sense since I think it's likely that Barnabas changed the country's flag, as the current flag mostly refers to Slepnir, which is Odin's horse, and as we know, Barnabas came to Lude from an outside continent and took control of everything by force as Odin, so it's possible that Lude wasn't even home to Odin in the first place. My second guess, which I think is more likely, is that something happened to her past at her home village or country, and maybe she inherited Garuda's power around this time, and this event is what turned her into the cold and calculating person that she is. Based on this backstory, I think it's a safe guess that this event revolves around the death of someone that she may have known or once loved, and this necklace may be a reminder to her of this person. It could be her light in the darkness, you could say. Now, for all we know, she didn't have to grow up in Walud. Instead, she could have grown up in a smaller village or maybe another city lost to the blight. Regardless, this is obviously a memento that she keeps so that she won't forget whoever it belonged to in the past. We then see a very quick scene of Clive and Joshua walking into what seems likely to be the palace, and probably to go talk to their father. Actually, if we go back to this earlier scene, we can see that this railing and background is exactly where Clive is looking off towards the moon, just the camera is panned down slightly. The other nice thing here is that we see Clive holding Joshua's hand as they walk. My guess is that the conversation they're about to have with their father is about riding to Phoenix Gate, and Joshua is scared of the coming war since he'll have to fight as Phoenix 
Phoenix, and so Clive is there to support him as a loving brother, which obviously shows some great characterization of them. Another quick scene shows the Archduke Elwyn bumping Clive on the chest as Jill holds Torgal in the background. This is likely when the Archduke is about to ride out to Phoenix Gate, I think, and I'm guessing this is probably just Elwyn showing Clive that he trusts and loves him, which, again, another great thing. If I were to guess, they're probably going to try to hammer home the familial love early on because we know that the Duke dies and we know that Joshua kind of dies, and that is a driving force for Clive. Then we see Clive holding on to a Phoenix feather in a desert while he's wearing his red outfit. Based on his beard, I have to think that this is maybe 20. 20s Clive, but I'm not positive since we can't see if he has a brand or not. My guess is, is that this might be a clue to Clive and the first indication to him that Phoenix is still alive, which leads him to track him down at Drake's breath. I say this because the way he's holding it, it seems to me to be less of him treasuring a memento of his brother and instead confusion as maybe this feather lands on his chest and he isn't sure how it came to be there. This would also explain how Clive gets on the path of tracking down Phoenix in the first place, as otherwise we currently don't have a real reason for him to go to Drake's breath first, other than maybe they thought it'd be the easiest mother crystal to destroy. The setting in the desert, though, is interesting, as based on my theories, you wouldn't go to the desert until after going to Rosaria, but maybe the scene just takes place in the Deadlands, which is also very deserty. We then have a Howling Torgal scene, which we've seen before in the Pax image and the state of play. If I freeze frame here, we can see that Clive, Jill, and Torgal are on a small boat as they're and ancient ruins and some barren lands in the background. So either this is in the desert or this is some blighted land that they're passing through. If I want to break out the tinfoil hat, maybe they're heading to back to the northern territories as Torgal might be crying out as he returns home. That's a very common trope with wolves. But yeah, that's a tinfoil hat theory and a bit of a stretch. Now we get to the final scene and this scene is a doozy. Here we see Jill kneeling before some flowers in the Deadlands as Clive, Goats, Charon, and Byron all look on. The first thing that stuck out to me when I looked at the scene was the lack of Sid, especially with a lot of the hideaway members there. Plus, the framing of the scene with Jill kneeling before some flowers makes it almost feel like a funeral, as if they're about to leave something or someone behind. So, with the setting in the Deadlands, which we know the hideaway's in, the somber funeral feeling, and the lack of Sid, my brain went to the same place most people went, which is, this is them making a grave for Sid, or at the very least, the hideaway. If I were to guess, this scene I think might be right around the five-year time skip, either right before, right after. Based on Clive's double, I'm thinking right after, and this would be right before we go to Delmechia, as we know that Goats is with us in Delmechia from the main quest that we saw in the PAX footage. And there's actually a lot going on with the hideaway that I've been thinking about lately, especially with us seeing some of the hideaway functions move to a new location in the state of play. I do think that the hideaway might be attacked and destroyed before the five-year time skip, and then during that five-year time skip, the group will move base. In fact, one of the comments on my last video by a user named Dees, he mentioned that if you look at the renowned lady's conversation, one of her text options is us asking what happened in the past five years. So chances are at the very least that Clive hasn't been communicating with the hideaway in that five year time skip. So my personal theory that I came up with based on this information is that before the time skip, we leave the volcano, Clive has burned off his brand, but he's still 28. We go and fight Hugo and Rosaria and we liberate Rosaria. Now Clive is the only remaining member of the royal family at this point. So I think it's entirely possible that he spends five years rebuilding Rosaria and like I said, something might have happened in the hideaway during this time and they have to move base. And if Clive is the leading figure in Rosaria who is rebuilding it, I think it's very likely that Clive might have allowed them to move the base of operations from the Dunlands to Rosaria. So it's quite possible that we, the scene that we saw with Mid here actually takes place in Rosaria. And now the other really important thing is that Jill is putting flowers on what seems like this grave. And so you can get really deep into the symbology of flowers and what they mean. And so now I'm going to put my tinfoil hat back on real quick as I kind of talk about it. But first things first, we see these two flowers and a gust of wind comes and blows all of their petals off. Now, when a flower loses all of its petals, that means it's pretty much died at that point. But like all things, they may have died, but likely before this death, they managed to pollinate with some other flower and create new flowers. So it's one of death, but also rebirth, right? And if you look at the flowers, they have two different colors. Now, colors and flowers have meant things for a long time to all sorts of royalty and authors. One of the flowers is purple and the other one is pink. Now, 
This is less symbolic and more literal, but I think that it's possible that the purple one represents Sid, as his main color is purple with his jacket and the lightning aspect. Now, the pink petals, I think, could have two different meanings. Either there's a second prominent character who died in this attack on the hideaway, and her main color is pink, or it could be more symbolic, where pink generally means love and happiness. So it's possible that Sid has now passed on, happy and fulfilled, sharing his love with all these people. Of course, this theory would also mean that Sid died, right? Because the petals blowing away, like I said, represents death of that flower. So if the purple flower represents Sid, then Sid has died. Taking the tinfoil hat back off though, the only other thing left for us to look at is this clearly marked symbol on the wall. To me, this symbol looks like a torch. And my guess is, is that this might be the symbol of the resistance or the hideaway as they're basically operating an underground railroad smuggling branded people to safety, lighting the way for them. And hint, hint, this also loops back around to the main theme which is the role that the moon plays at night at lighting the path before you. We then have a close-up of Ifrit at the very end looking at you, but honestly, I think we might have seen this before. I think the interesting part here is that he does have orange eyes, so it's not Clive in control. It's either Clive out of control or maybe the dark icon, if that even exists. So again, looking at this symbolically, this might mean that Ifrit is connected to the last grave scene that we just looked at, but I feel like I've already stretched my theories pretty far at this point, deep into tinfoil hat territory, so I'll stop here. Overall though, this trailer showed us a lot of information, just it was all out of context and in very short segments. And and while I had a lot to say, because of this lack of context, this video turned out a lot more analyzing the symbology and crafting more loose theories based on these narrative elements than in my past videos where I based pretty much all of my theories off of more concrete, hard and fast rules and facts. So if you like the style of tinfoil hat theory crafting, let me know. Also, since this was such a loose theory video, I'm sure it spawned quite a few theories out there of your own, and feel free to share those theories with me in the comments. Since I don't think everything is as black and white as we've seen before, I think it'll be a lot of fun spitballing ideas off one another. And of course, if you like the video, leave a like. If you want to see what I might make next, feel free to subscribe. We know that there's another set of interviews coming out pretty soon, I would guess maybe within the next week. And if you want want to you can check out one of the videos that should be popping up on the screen right now with all that said though i hope you all have a good day